are going to move to next uh, talk. It's going to be presented by Dr. Merwan Debach from uh, Central Superlec from uh, Paris, France. The uh, title of the talk is Electromagnetic Information Theory, Past, uh, Present, and Future. Uh, Dr. Merwan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'm extremely happy to be here. Um, and one of the reasons I, I, I was very happy to be here because basically the, the work you, you're doing at TII today in terms of, I would say, overall uh, new physics paradigms and, and, uh, and metamaterials is today having a huge impact on the roadmap of, of what we consider as the future of 5G. Uh, as you know, one of the biggest technology that was uh, enabling the progress of 5G was a technology called Massive MIMO with respect to the fact that we had multiple antennas at a base station at a, at a number which exceeds what we used to know, more than 128 elements dual polarized. And today it seems that uh, uh, massive modes uh, and uh, let's say metamaterials are having uh, a big bet in terms of the progress they'll be doing in the application. So my talk here is gonna be about uh, uh, the use of these metamaterials for communication, but also understanding the fundamental limits or trying to understand the fundamental limits that can be brought by using metamaterials in communication. And of course, this is not new. Uh, it's been many years, if you look at the papers, especially for the people who are publishing in the HP transactions on uh, propagation antennas, where this, I would say, merger of the physics and, physics and um, let's say communication community has been tried basically. Uh, whereas in the classical communication community, they've been more around more, I would say, digital signal processing aspects. And today we're seeing this merger, which means also that there's more and more interdisciplinary research, which is going on. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm professor at Central Super Elec, but I'm also leading um, the research basically of Huawei in France within two labs, which is one about more beyond 5G communication, another one which is mostly around computing, and mathematics. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a specialist of, um, let's say, information theory and communication. And uh, since I would say five years working intensively on uh, uh, AI and especially on the implementation chipsets and uh, everything which is related to deep learning, which is also basically uh, having a huge uh, impact today in what we call native AI networks. But the fact that today, in how you construct networks, they're more and more smarter, and for which basically we're moving from more, I would say, a computing uh, centric uh, system to more data centric, and how we can exploit that. Okay, so uh, if we look at the telecommunication, of course, they've been engaging in various uh, movements. Um, I think you're all familiar with 2G, which is mostly considered as something related to mobile for voice. And then 3G came in uh, with the, the things you know, like CDMA, which is mostly about mobile for data. Uh, 4G came in and it mo was mostly about mobile for internet. And of course, this internet um, mobility with internet, of course, had a huge impact. And we know it today and how we feel it. Of course, the target of 5G at the start was, was more or less uh, uh, mobile for things. Although the actual deployments in the world that we're seeing are more around the broadband. Uh, and one of the reasons today is that many operators are not able to make money out of IoT and they're still considering some business models on how you can make money out of, out of tweets because that's what basically uh, is happening. And as you all know, you can't basically uh, uh, make people pay the connectivity, but it's more around the data that you capture and basically how you process it. And that's where basically the classical software companies are. And now, of course, with this convergence of communication and computing, well, we are building today what we call machines. Machines are, of course, intelligent things with AI enable, enabled in that. You can call them robots. You can call it uh, uh, things which are going to happen by the year 2035, roughly, and for which you start to build basically the framework by 2030. And these machines, of course, will require communication paradigms, but also a lot of sensing paradigms. And of course, sensing and all, everything which is related to imaging will have a huge part because they need to move around them. And these are the discussions that we're having today within the roadmap, which is being built around the world for the next standard. 
So there's a huge opportunity for all of us here to work together in the sense that the technology research has to be done in the next, I would say, two to three years. By 2023, uh, the majority of the technology will be shaped up. And then there will be a work around what we call the study items of 3GBB to start you know, identifying what is basically uh, enough to be poured in 6G. And then the standardization in 2026 will start. And hopefully uh, we will have a, a 6G framework being deployed by 2030. So the window is quite short in the sense that you need to make some breakthroughs in the next two, three years. So that basically the whole process can go on with this, I would say, uh, 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 worldwide uh, convergence of uh, many companies trying to pour in systems. So of course, uh, as of today, and, and this is also the message I wanna push is that uh, the KPIs of 6G have been roughly identified around the world. And now there's many consortiums, especially in Europe, uh, around what we call Horizon Europe, but also uh, many, I would say, uh, parts of the world like China on which we have converged basically on the requirements of what would be 6G, okay? Uh, one of the big things is one terabit wireless, which is not extremely easy to do, and for which higher frequencies will play a role. And this is why I'm coming here to you guys to give a talk, because you're dealing more and more with optical, and optical is making more and more sense in communication, because we're not trying to pour in, basically, uh, radio frequencies in higher frequencies, but trying, basically, to mimic what you're doing at the optical level to bring it down at the RFL level. And that's what we're, we're seeing here with optical ADCs and stuff like that. The other, of course, is also everything which is around sensing and positioning has become a big issue uh, because of these machines that I'm talking about in which they're moving and for which the accuracy has to be extremely high. We're talking about one centimeter indoor and 50 centimeter outdoor. Latency is also an issue. The coverage is also extremely important on how you can enhance deeply the coverage and today, one of the big problems we're having with IoT deployments is that they're very, uh, let's say, uh, particular to each scenario, and we can't do this anymore. Otherwise, there are costs kicking in, and we need to have some kind of uniform deployment because we know that if you have a glasses, if you have some kind of concrete material, the way you do our coverage is, is very different, and this makes our life uh, very difficult. And also energy efficiency, which has become a huge thing, and we know that analog techniques that you are playing with have, of course, a lot of good features in terms of being very energy efficient in how we do things. So, of course, you can tell me why do we need the next generation and how those KPIs were done. Well, here you have a list, of course, of uh, uh, applications that were forecasting by 2035. First is, of course, this extremely immersive experience with the fact that the resolution when you have an image which is coming closer and closer to your eyes, you have this, immer this immersive experience requires a lot of data rate. Then you have all these, what we call uh, haptic communication and the fact that you have this human perception at a very far distance, and this is related to latency. Sensing and imaging, the phone typically is the, the heart of uh, the next generation terahertz communication in the sense that you will be able to scan your food with a, with a, with a, with a smartphone. You will be able to see through these frequencies, your environment position, and also basically through uh, machine learning analytics behind, be able to classify things. The other one also is the fact that although today we've been building things and we've been building machines, we don't know how humans can interact with these machines and how humans can communicate with these machines. So we need to build up also the protocols for that. The smart urban life is also extremely important. Another aspect that has come into play is, of course, uh, the 3D scenario. Uh, flying things are going to happen very near, and we need to build up basically some kind of antennas, which can do 3D beamforming today, but maybe antennas that can radiate at a very large scale level to be able to cope with interference, which is coming at very high layers in your environment. The fact that AI is also part of all the things that we're doing, and especially the fact that uh, we will have pervasive AI, and in which we have, will have also, uh, let's say, antennas, which will be computing units. So today, as you know, many people are working on meta surfaces, which are able to compute what we call uh, 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 differential equations, and which are able basically to compute some of the functions that we need 
So these units are not anymore just the fact that they can communicate, but they're also units that can also compute things. And this convergence of communication and computing at the edge or at the antenna will also be a big, uh, uh, I would say, uh, 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 hype in the next year. And all of this, of course, is also with the fact that I think you know in Europe we're having a lot of problems with the fact that uh, uh, acceptance of today 5G is not so good. Uh, people are burning base stations uh, because of, uh, of the consumption that they're doing and also the fact that people become fearful. So we need to build up some new technologies which are compatible, I would say, with the realm of what people are used to and analog uh, aspects seems to come back in terms of how they are compatible with the consumption that people are willing to accept for our environment. Before I start my talk, which is related exactly to uh, the uh, conference, I would like just to highlight uh, the four paradigms which are hitting us today and in which you guys at Dirk uh, will play an immense role. The first one uh, is the fact that in communication today, uh, uh, there's a big change due to the fact that we have a lot of storage units and a lot of memory, which is available everywhere. And because of that, of course, it changes the way you communicate in the sense that because you can store the past of your communication, you can build up a context between devices and machines when they communicate. And therefore, when you communicate, you can transmit less data for the same impact of your communication. I think you uh, live this with, the, let's say, your wife or your husband in, in the house. In general, you don't need to tell your wife or your husband many things. She understands fully because there's a context which had been built. Shannon, of course, in his model had forgotten uh, the fact that memory was there and the fact that you don't restart the communication from scratch every time. There's a past which has been established and that you can explode. And AI, of course, is playing a big role. Second important aspect that also was forgotten by Shannon is that the environment was taken as an independent entity within your communication from the TX and RX. In the communication realm, people have been mostly communicating by either changing the transmitter by new modulation schemes, doing some kind of, of sophisticated pre-coding techniques, or improving the, equal, the, the, the receiver through sophisticated equalization schemes. And uh, all this has been happening for years. And recently, we realized that the environment could be programmable. We could control the environment. And by controlling the environment, we could make the environment compatible with our communication. We could adapt the environment by changing its texture in the realm of smart cities so that basically a wall could be moved in some sense. So you don't move the wall, but you will be able to change the texture of the wall by providing some kind of constructive interference instead of destructive interference. And this is due to the fact that we can control those metasurfaces. And of course, these are discussed today on how the environment become smart and how you can change. The third one, of course, is also the fact that there are new tools which are happening from the signal processing community, which are related to the, due to the fact that because of the hardware being very dirty, many people in the past have been trying to compensate those dirtiness by back off techniques. And all these techniques we realize today that in fact, whenever you have a medium which has a very dirty behavior, which of course impacts non-linearities. We have now new techniques which can exploit those non-linearities. This is typically non-linear OFDM, for example, techniques that we have today, which are able uh, to transmit over non-linear mediums. And in optical today, for example, many people are working on what we call uh, the non-linear Fourier transform to be able to do that. And today, I think the physical layer which is needed to be compatible with your techniques that you're building is also something that we're capturing today in the communication society. There's no reason why the classical, I would say, uh, physical layer techniques which are used in 5G and 4G, which are more on the linear regime, would be compatible with a world where metasurfaces are everywhere and for which basically we have an end-to-end nonlinear system and for which now we have the tools. And the last one is, of course, the new physics paradigms that we're seeing. And these are related to uh, what was spoken in the first talk, is that because of the fact that we're going in higher frequencies, the fact that we are also in some cases more line of sight, we have new modes of transmissions that were not exploited. And these are related to Bessel beams, OEM, holographic MIMO, which enable to pour in basically more data or simplify 
the DSP and the receiver. Typically, OEM today is a very, uh, uh, I would say, attractive venue in communication. There's been a lot of trials done recently uh, at bandwidths, uh, which are basically of the two, three gigahertz and bands, which are around 60 to 70 gigahertz, showcasing basically the huge data rates that you can get back with some distances which are compatible with what we call backholing in communication. Okay. If I needed now to go on the first three to start my discussion, the first one, of course, as I told you, is uh, uh, the way people today are revisiting the whole Shannon point of view that we had by incorporating the fact that now there's smartness at the TX and RX. And I told you with that, the way people are seeing Shannon, what we call 2.0, is looking through the lens of what we call semantic communication. It means that you're looking exactly at contextual information because of the fact that you can store the past. And this is changing a lot of things today in communication. The second is the environment. And there's today a lot of trials showcasing what we call smart walls and showcasing that on a classical point-to-point -point communication with MIMO in an environment on which you did not add smart walls and in which you start adding smart walls, you can increase drastically either the rate or the coverage by factors which go by a factor of 300%. So there's a lot of people papers done by people who are more, I would say, people in the realm of wave control. And the fact that they could bring those things at even the Wi-Fi level. So this is an experiment which was done at the Wi-Fi, showcasing that you can increase your coverage indoor by huge factor by using these, uh, I would say, reflect arrays, meta surface based, and by finding the right, I would say, pattern of changes and phases compatible with your mobility, which enables that. And you have to know that today, uh, uh, companies like Airbus are highly interested in that because as you know, Wi-Fi is a big issue in airplanes and you, mean, you need to reduce the power of Wi-Fi and still be able to converge basically the energy towards the people who are working on their laptops, for example. And of course, this is very nice because uh, uh, it changes the environment because it changes nearly the snail's law. Before we used to use relays and thanks to you guys, we're able basically to uh, 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 compute some functions such as we can redirect our information towards the destination. And of course, this has to be done in general. This is where the communication guys kick in within what we call the mobility pattern because this has to go very fast within the fact that the guy moves. And these are things that people are studying today and which are providing the right framework to do that. And of course, this is also possible because of uh, the new types of antennas that you're building and for which, uh, which, we were, which was something that we had forgotten in the realm of communication. And as you see today, it goes nearly in all directions uh, in the different communities with all different types of, of, of uh, antennas going from terahertz technology to ultra wideband to phase array radars. And these are coming more and more to be more customized within a, a smartphone or a base station. Now let's go to understanding what's happening and how we can build this convergence. Now, uh, the classical uh, framework of information theory was mostly uh, concerned about uh, a model that Shannon built in which you had what we call an information source, a transmitter, a receiver, and a destination, and in which you added what we call an additive white Gaussian noise. And today, uh, in between was something that we used to model in a very simple manner with classical uh, channels, which are what we call of the Rayleigh fading type or the rice type. And because of the antenna structure that uh, you've been importing, we realized that depending on the boundary conditions that you put on your antenna, well, you can create new modes of transmission. And this is something that uh, in our community, we were not so basically inclined to look at. And of course, by creating those boundary conditions, you have some new modes that you can transmit and basically that you can exploit in terms, as I told you, of increasing basically the transmission rate or in some cases, for example, when you do MIMO and OEM, uh, where you cannot do better than what MIMO does already to uh, simplify uh, basically the receiver structure of your different modes. So of course, uh, when you look at it, uh, the whole framework of the communication society and information theory was very mathematical oriented. And I'm part of that, I have to admit. 
on which basically the focus was more about the mathematical theory communication and everything was done in a digital manner to go forward with that. Uh, as I was saying, so Denis Gabor, and it was mentioned before, was one of the first guy who, uh, who realized quite rapidly that there was a problem with the statistical view viewpoint of Shannon and you needed to merge both. Of course, uh, the community of communication realized that also, but the problem is that those, uh, uh, let's say, deterministic Maxwell equations were so ugly then to incorporate them in a nice manner was difficult. But we lost a lot of time, I think, by not understanding quite rapidly that. So if you take history, of course, uh, uh, Denis Gabor was one of the guy pointing it. It took a bit of time of, of, of uh, not taking into account because AWGN channels, what we call it, white Goshen nose channel, was quite good at that time to model, especially the space towards communication. And this is why people worked a lot on the coding realm. And then, of course, the EM uh, uh, people came in because wireless was kicking back again. And I think you know these names uh, going from Franceschetti to Sarkar, which is within between some people who are signal processing folks who have been building basically the, the, the steps towards understanding better how to merge what we call uh, electromagnetics and information theory or also wave theory of information. And if you look back, uh, depending on, 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 on the people, there has been a lot of, of, of steps which have been done until recently, I would say in the last two years where uh, the inventor of massive MIMO called Thomas Marzeda has been reconsidering basically the whole framework of massive MIMO by in incorporating basically uh, the Fourier plane wave series representation and being able to look at the modes and how basically we can compute those modes and exploit them for communication within the realm of holographic MIMO, which is becoming today. And today in the community, there's a lot of work which is being done, especially on the millimeter wave, trying to cope with that. And so what does this, in, well, I would say, information, electromagnetic information theory can do? First of all, of course, it brings the capability of increasing the capacity because basically you start uh, uh, exploding new types of modes and new types of transmission modes in axial and angular domain. And especially for cases where uh, you can basically do some kind of alignment, what we call the beam alignment uh, issue in our case. And we have a lot of cases where this is important. The second is of course the reduced complexity of the transceiver chain in the sense that uh, doing DSP today with bandwidths at the millimeter wave or terahertz with basically which are of the two to 10 gigahertz bandwidth is extremely complex for us. And today the receiver type of OEM is very important. The other of course is also the new types of channels because the far field approximation which was done does not hold anymore because of the sizes and the bandwidths and the frequency that we're using and where the spherical wave models are changing a lot of things. The other aspect also is the new types of antennas that we're uh, using. And these, are, of course, are also changing through what I, ca I called here the, uh, the, the, the boundary conditions, the kind of, of modes that you transmit. And the last one, uh, and tomorrow, one of my colleagues called Matthias Fink will be giving a talk about it, is, of course, all the, the problematic of how to cope with communication, mobility, and doing this wave control so that your environment does this constructive interference. And today you see that number of, uh, um, I would say new technologies which are emerging from uh, this uh, field of electromagnetic information theory and for which some of the uh, names that I'm putting here on the slides are candidates today for the next generation wireless. One is holographic MIMO on which we have already a couple of companies which are developing some products around that and on which instead of having uh, 64 RF chains for a classical MIMO setting, you will have only one RF chains, which could control basically your beam and direct, direct activity. Then you have, of course, the extreme large antenna aperture, which is also coming in, in terms of antenna design. Then you have all the framework of what we call intelligent surfaces, which are built in uh, basically with panels and in which basically you can redirect your information and increase basically uh, the capability or degrees of freedom of your environment. The fact also that uh, you've been moving from uh, things like far field to more near field communication, and this changes a lot of paradigm in your communication with also spherical waves. And also these, I would say new modes, OAM is one, but you have a bunch of, of modes that are now being considered for which you have a transmission. 
And each one, of course, has uh, uh, some advantages and drawbacks, uh, especially on having the downsize and compactness that is needed to be put in your devices. And also basically the, the complexity energy efficiency that you can pour in in your system. Uh, uh, I don't have much time now, but roughly uh, I just wanted to pour to a couple of slides quite rapidly. I have to go on them. But basically, of course, uh, the revisit, how you revisit now the classical information theory by taking these two things is, of course, by going back to the continuous space. And as you know, going back in the continuous space is exactly what people have been doing, where you consider what we call a transmit vo volume with, a, with some kind of electro ele ele uh, electromagnetic source, and in which you have the classical, basically, uh, 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 pointing vector which happened and also receiver volume. And these are the classical two things which are important with this uh, green function, which of course represents your model, okay? And uh, basically when you start computing that, well, you have an electromagnetic source for which uh, you will uh, compute basically uh, 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 this, uh, this, uh, this uh, source current and on which basically you have your propagation on which you will modulate. You have this uh, green function that I think you're all familiar with in your community, which represents basically your medium and in which you have all the, the wave number uh, 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 series which are happening. And then the receiver side on which you ex excite your uh, uh, antenna display and on which you can get back your signal and which you modulate. And then of course you need to define basically the modes of your transmission to something that is very representative, which is related to your environment and especially what we call the Egan mode. And there, basically, depending on, on the boundary conditions that you have, you, you can transmit on these uh, orthonormal functions, which represents your signal. And you can do a classical techniques that we know to maximize the capacity, which is the water filling formula, which basically will transmit on those modes which you have been, create, you have been able to create when you start densifying. And, and this is exactly the, the kind of expression that you get, and when which here, N0 is the noise uh, density. Uh, gamma there is basically the, 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 the modes on which you will transmit your information. And uh, basically, uh, uh, sigma is going to be your power on which you're going to transmit your, your signal. Now, when you do that in general, you need to use the general EM theory because that's how you will compute. And in general, uh, this gets a bit ugly. In the ugly in the sense that when you start computing the whole type of rate that you can have with respect to a given environment, it gets extremely ugly when you start pouring in all those equations with respect to the very nice formulation that Shannon had done, okay? And I think you're also familiar, and we've done it. We're, we're doing it today, considering all these uh, uh, different electrical modes and H modes to be able to compute the full uh, degrees of freedom that you can have when you densify a certain display with an infinite number of antennas and how much you can pour in with all the, the problems of correlation and all the problems of, 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 of also interactions that you have within your elements of antennas. Of course, uh, one way to solve this problem in our community is to look at what we call the degrees of freedom, which means roughly how many modes you can transmit at very high SNR. You're not looking at a finite regime capacity, but what we call the degrees of freedom. And there, uh, depending on the type of aperture that you have, uh, these are classical techniques that we use. You can know basically what is your multiplexing capability that you have for a given type of antenna that you have, uh, volume aperture, planar aperture, uh, irrespective of what you're doing. And the other, of course, is also all these questions that I think uh, uh, people in your community are familiar with and in which now we are dealing with in terms of what we call uh, uh, modulated arrays or adaptation of independence towards your environment so that you can maximize basically the flux of information that you're, transmission, that you're transmitting. And today we have a lot of results showcasing how much you can pour in by really adapting basically your environment and your antenna to the uh, point that I'm mentioning. I'll finish with, with a couple of words just to tell you that for the moment, I haven't spoken about the intelligent environment. I'm just have been spoken about traumatic information theory in which I incorporate basically the antenna structure in the modeling of an end-to-end -to, -end to do, define the sort of Shannon capacity. But the biggest gain, of course, are related to basically this scenario where you have basically a base station 
you have some kind of a holographic surface uh, far away or near with one TX, and then you have a couple of multi-users that you're transmitting, you're transmitting. And in which basically today, we're seeing a lot of gains poured in by energy efficiency, uh, the focus that you can do towards uh, your users. You have to know that before these kind of surfaces were called relays, which were basically not intelligent relays in the sense that they would not do any kind of beam forming. They would just do some kind of amplifying forward. And these are deployed in the world today. However, with the capability that we have today to beam directly with some kind of intelligent relay, and this is what we call these large intelligent surfaces, we're able to do it. And you have today a couple of different ways of doing it uh, and which are being tested to be able to understand the benefit of either increased coverage, increased capacity, uh, better energy efficiency in terms of communication. And here I listed basically the case of discrete meta surfaces or continuous meta surfaces. And you have also a couple of, of companies which have been building these uh, uh, kind of meta surfaces and you can go uh, uh, today on various uh, startups. Greener Wave is one, uh, Pivotal Come Wave is another one. And you have a couple of uh, meta wave is also a third one, which are providing today those kind of, of, uh, of uh, I would say, devices for our community uh, to be able to look at how you can do either some kind of scattering, focusing, absorbing, or polarizing for enhancing basically the way you communicate. I'll finish just by one point. Uh, of course, this uh, opens the door for the communication community for a lot of new, I would say, modulation formats. Uh, what I mean by that is that we are able today to build codes. When I mean codes, I mean communication codes, which are compatible with basically these meta surfaces. We are able also to find ways on how we can build protocols, such as the changes within uh, uh, the uh, REST, reflect intelligent surfaces, are compatible with mobility, with some ACNAC mechanism or with some learning mechanisms. So you can, you can change basically the pattern of your phases around your RIS, either in a binary way or in a more, I would say, structured with more constellation. And these are things that can be pushed within the standardization because exactly the kind of signaling that you will be building or what is gonna be standardized so that people who are building those meta surfaces can be able to be, can sell, sell them to improve basically the coverage in different scenario. I think I took too much time. I'll stop here and, and, and answer some of your questions. Oh, it's perfect, it's perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miran. Um, are there questions from the, from the public, from the audience? Very interesting uh, talk and topic. I don't know if there are... Uh, so I, I just, I have a, a small question if, if, if there are no more. Um, how do you consider the noise in all this uh, scenario? You know, practically the capacity of the channel uh, is related to the bandwidth and the noise, yeah, the, the typical bandwidth capacity, um, channel capacity equation. How is the noise, what is the role of the noise in this, uh, in this uh, new paradigm? The first one is that the frequencies that are being uh, discussed today for the future are at the millimeter wave level and terahertz level, which are things that you are dealing today with. And, and I think this is very uh, important. And second is that uh, uh, the kind of, of surfaces that you're building today are have, I would say, the compatibility in terms of densification that we're looking at in terms of how much elements you can pour in for a given surface to be able to pack more information. Okay, there is another question here by Dr. Schauke. Any idea how to mix Pico cells and a smarter repeater in indoor applications? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So the biggest, uh, I would say today, problem of adoption of, uh, let's say, meta surfaces uh, is not technology wise, but deployment wise. And this is a very good question. What I mean by that is that uh, uh, many companies have already started to sell basically the fact that they would sell you a Wi-Fi box with some kind of panel that you will get at home. And this is not kicking in in the market. They're not kicking in because people, you know, you need to, to hang it on top of, of your Wi-Fi box, a panel 
uh, uh, or a smart panel in your thing. So we need to think hard on how basically we can integrate uh, these meta surfaces. I saw uh, before some talks about transparent uh, things. So there's some kind of a work on adoption on how basically this could be embedded uh, on, 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 on in the environment so that there is what we call public acceptance. You have to know for your for information, for example, in the small cell setting, uh, which was one of the uh, uh, the realm of 4G, one way to push that was that we decided to put the small cells behind the screens of uh, uh, JC Deco. I don't know if you know JC Deco. JC Deco is what you see in the airport, those big panels. Or when you stop at the uh, at, at, at a station, you have something where they put these uh, uh, commercial ads. And yeah. so you have to know that in many places, behind that, <laughs> because there's electricity, we put basically small cells which radiate and enable to improve the coverage in, in, in cities. And so you need to be smart in how you do these things. So basically in, in the concept of, uh, of a cellular network, we are deploying in ODBs and in the past base stations to cover specific areas. Yes. Uh, when we deploy meta surfaces or uh, smart repeaters, um, we, we, how are we going to take into account the increase of coverage if we don't have a remote control of those uh, particular devices? Okay, so, so, so that's a very good question. In fact, the way people are doing it, so today the majority of business case is indoor. Uh, we're still trying to find ways to how to do it in outdoor. But the way you do it is the following, is that uh, uh, when, you trans when the base station transmits to a user, you have an ACNAC which comes back from the user. And so what happens is that the meta surfaces changes its phases uh, so, for example, imagine your meta surface is one, 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 one. Okay, you, and then you have a knack, which is the guy did not get a good thing. Then the meta surface changes one flip minus one and keep all the others, and then you get a knack until you get the right one. So, of course, you're not going to do a full search. We have gradient descent algorithms which go fast to find rapidly within a couple of knacks what is the right. I would say uh, uh, code book. We call this a code book, by the way to be able to beam towards your destination. So this is how it's done. Uh, we don't estimate all the channels or whatever. It's just through the ACNAC that you change the phases here. So there's a signaling change, 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 and then you find the right pattern. The big question we have today is the question of what we call exploration versus exploitation. Meaning by the, by the time you explore, the guy should not move too fast. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Because if, if you converge to the right beam and the guy has already moved to some place elsewhere, then of course uh, you're continuously learning uh, while beaming. And this of course has a, a, an impact. And these are the things which are trying to be settled. That's why indoor, it turns out to work quite well. In general, the mobility is not so much. Outdoor, you know, you can go with a car, things like that. And this is what people are trying to, 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 to understand better. I see. Hey, thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Merwan.